So I know we have an exam coming up, and uh, what I would like to do is show you a problem that contains a few sort of tips and tricks that naturally occur as uh, we roll along, right? As we, as we encounter certain problems, there are certain things you can do that might make them easier than if you hadn't seen these tips to, you know, to start with. So, so we'll get started with this. Um, this is a truss. You can see the dimensions up here. Um, you can see that we are loading the truss a little bit differently than sort of your standard uh, just arrow, uh, you know, applied, you know, arrow meaning a force vector applied to some place along the truss. And so we have it, instead of that, we actually have a uh, pulley system there that is applying the force onto the truss. Okay? And we're given the instructions right up there at the top that we are supposed to find the force carried in member IJ. All right? So, question for you. If this is, you encounter this, and you're trying to fin you know, find this force in IJ as quickly as possible, what, what are you going to do first? Okay? So a lot of you are answering something along the lines of method of sections, and I think you're probably right in terms of how you should think about doing the trust problem, right? So I think that is definitely where we're going to go. Um, but before we can really do method of sections proper, do we have a preliminary stuff that we need to do? Okay. So a lot of you are now saying, yeah, we kind of said back when we did method of sections, Maybe we need to find reaction forces first, okay? Well, you might be surprised on this one, so just stay tuned, okay? Even if we don't need to do reaction for forces first, what do we need to do first before we can really start the trust problem on this example? Right now, we don't know exactly how much force is being applied to pin the pin at H, and so what I'd like to do is spend the first couple of minutes here uh, showing you how you can know in a pulley system like this what the resultant force is going to be acting on one end or the other of the of the pulley system, okay? And I'm going to do that with a free body diagram. So let's think through what a free body diagram would look like of this, uh, basically this whole assembly right here that has the pulleys on it, okay? And so if we draw that, It'll look something like this, right? We'll have this uh, sort of finger thing that's coming down through the middle. And we'll have a pulley that's right here and another pulley that's right here. Okay. Now let's think about the forces that would be applied to that piece. Okay. One of them might be pretty obvious, and it's because it's given, right? We're saying we're pulling on one of the ropes with 50 pounds, right? So where would we put that? Where does that rope go? It goes to right here, right? So why don't I show 50 pounds pulling right here? Okay. So far so good, huh? But what else? All right. Here's where I need to kind of mention something in case you haven't heard it yet. Anytime ropes go around frictionless pulleys, and by the way, if you see pulleys on a test and it doesn't tell you anything about you should consider friction for this pulley, what do you think you can do? You can typically assume it's frictionless, even if you're not told that. Um, and the reason for that is that pulleys typically don't have a lot of friction in them relative to the amounts of force that might be transmitted through them. Okay, so it's a reasonable enough assumption to make that it might be a frictionless pulley. But anyway, every time a rope goes around a frictionless pulley, all the pulley does is change the direction of the force that acts in the rope. It does not change the magnitude of the force that acts in the rope. Okay? And so by that rope going around the upper pulley there and coming around the other side, what do you think the force is going to be where the rope comes off on this other side? another 50 pounds. It didn't change the force magnitude. All it did was change the force direction. Okay. Well, now think about following that force. You know, there's right now we're looking at this little rope over here. It comes down and through this pulley. 
and out the other side, what's the force over here going to be? Still 50 pounds, right? Because it's going around another frictionless pulley. And now it's coming up here. And what is the effect of that 50 pounds and that rope going to be on the bottom side of the lower pulley on the upper part? Right? I'm trying to describe that properly, but basically right here. What's the effect going to be right there? Okay, another 50 pounds, again, in tension, right? All everywhere it's pulling on here is in tension. And so that's going to, again, pull in the direction of that rope. Another 50 pounds. And then that rope goes around that pulley. Now, some of you, the real sticklers in the room, you're going to look at that and say, ooh, where it comes off this other side over here, that angle looks like it might not be directly along, you know, parallel lines to these other 50 pound forces that we just put on here. Right? You see that? Okay. If we wanted to be super, super persnickety on that, we could say, yeah, we really should find that angle and really only take the component of the force that goes parallel. Right? We could, we could be that picky. How much difference do you think it would make? Probably very small, especially relative to the sizes of forces that we're talking about, and relative to the idea that we already made an assumption about whether or not it had friction in it, right? So we're trying to get a good answer that, you know, is good enough, right? And I would say it feels good enough to me to pretend like that force in that rope is straight along the same line as the other ropes, even though it is a little off. All right, so we'll just go ahead and acknowledge we're making that assumption and move forward with it, okay? So what should I do once I make that assumption? Another 50-pound force also in the same direction. Okay, so we've dealt with all of the forces acting, I believe, on that upper part as long as we're going to neglect weight, self-weight or something like that. But we probably did miss one. What other force do I need to think about? OK. Yeah, something better react against all these things. And you know, I'll mention this. Because H is a pin, the uh, you know, kind of the least amount of intuition, the way I would answer this is there must be two reactions of force there at H. Right? If I didn't have any intuition about this at all, I'd say, well, that's a pin, so I better have two components of reaction. Okay? But do you think I can do better than that in the interest of, of a fast solution? Okay? I see some heads nodding. Right? So what and why? What should I do different, and why is it okay? Okay? We notice that all of these... Um, all of these forces that are currently applied, at least if I drew them properly, they would all be going in the same direction as each other, which means right now my net force acting on this body is really going to be in that direction. So since I only have one other spot that a reaction can happen, that reaction is going to be opposite all of those original forces, right? So I can think through that and, and apply that logic and instead of showing two reactions of force, I can just show one reaction of force. Okay? And again, you know, I could name that if I want. I could name it maybe say F sub H. Right? So if that's F sub H, how do I figure out what it is? Okay. Well, remember, um, if you encounter a problem like this where there are no axes given yet, you can pick them. All right? And you can even pick them differently for individual parts of the problem that you're trying to solve. So what if I pick a set of axes here so that I make like one axis perpendicular to this and the other axis parallel? All right? Maybe I could name it like x prime and y prime or something like that. Okay? What does that do for me? gives you an axis that you can name and say, I'm going to sum forces along the x prime axis there. And when I do, 
I'll basically have minus four times 50 pounds plus F sub H, then what? Equals zero, which tells me F sub H is going to be equal to what? 200 pounds. Now, some of you might be annoyed right now at how slowly I did all of that. Many of you were able to look at that right at the beginning and say, I can tell there's going to be 200 pounds being applied at H. For those of you who knew that from the beginning, how did you know? Okay, so first of all, the angle part of it, um, it makes sense to a lot of you that it would have to, the angle of force that acts at H has to be along that angle that's identified there, direction of all the forces, right? So that I'm good with that, but how about the magnitude, the, the 200 pounds? You have four different places that this rope contacts that upper part. And since it's all one rope that just wraps around a couple different times, a lot of you already knew that that rope had better hold 50 pounds all the way through it because it's just one rope, right? And it goes over frictionless pulleys and that's all. So if it's one rope and all it's doing is go over fric going over frictionless pulleys, it means that it has to have the same value each time. Therefore, you could just multiply by the four places you see it coming off of that upper part and you can see that it must be 200 pounds, okay? So, but this is the, this is the actual like formal justification for why it's okay to do that, count up the number of ropes, okay? Um, any questions about that part before we move forward? Wonderful. So we've done the initial part here and found how much force must be acting on joint H. It's 200 pounds. So now what would you like to do? Okay. So remember, what we're trying to find is the force in IJ. Yeah, and I hear a few people saying we should find some external reactions first. And that wouldn't be a bad idea if you have to. I'm going to show you something you might really like here. What if I go ahead and think about making a cut through IJ right now before I even make any attempt at finding an external reaction? Okay. So what if I make a cut here and then look at a free body diagram of material that's to the right of that cut? Okay. Okay. His question just now is, couldn't you just as easily have made a cut? Um, I think maybe you're saying make a cut over here. Okay. So let me ask you all this. Um, is that okay? Can I make a cut over there? Okay. Is it much different, the process, depending on which way I make the cut? Okay. Because remember, once you make the cut, you're going to make a free body diagram of things that are to the right of the cut. Um, and I, to me, it looks like it doesn't make much difference whether, especially for finding member IJ, it doesn't make much difference whether I cut to one side or the other, okay? So, you know, sometimes it does. Sometimes it does make a difference. But for this question, I don't know that it makes a lot of difference which of those two cuts that I make. Either one will work, okay? So, let's choose our own adventure, right? Who wants the left cut? One person wants the left cut. Who wants the right cut? Hey, everyone wants the right cut. I think you're just being contrary. Fine, we'll do the right cut. Okay, so there's the right cut, and what do I need to draw now? A free body diagram of? Okay, everything to the right of the cut, and not including the members that I cut through, right? So what that leaves me is a triangle. Let me do it right down here. It leaves me a triangle that's something like this. Okay, this up here is joint G, this down here is joint H, this over here is joint I, okay, and uh, so what do I need to now add onto my free body diagram as far as forces that I removed when I chopped it off? 
tension in EG. Okay, I'll call that TEG. Okay, I'll have another one applied at I from IJ. That's the one I'm trying to find, right? So I'll name that TIJ. And what else? Okay, up here I've got um, EI, TEI, I'll call it. Okay. What other forces do I have acting on the body? Okay, we found this force that acts at H, right? And we said it's going to be 200 pounds. Okay, further, we're given what angle that acts at. So I'm going to go ahead and copy that onto this figure as well, 40 degrees. relative to vertical. Okay, so there's most of a free body diagram, I'd say. Are we missing anything? Okay, we might want a few dimensions on here. Before we really start doing dimensions, um, so let me ask you the question. Ultimately, because sometimes if you look ahead a little bit, you can see uh, you know, what, free, what uh, equilibrium equation am I shooting for? And that can help inform you as to the dimensions that really matter to you. So let's spend just a second doing that. What do you think we're going to do with this free body diagram? Okay. What we might want to do is look up here and see that where TEI and TEG are going to intersect is actually joint E, right? So if I draw some lines, tell you what, I need to slide this over a little bit more to make this make sense. Ah. <clears throat> okay, let's say I draw some dotted lines for TEG and TEI, and I find where these are going to intersect over here, that is joint E. And if my plan is that I'm going to some moments around point E, which is a good idea, why? Okay. Notice that TEI and TEG are forces I don't need to find. I'm not asked to find them, so I don't need them for, for this purpose. Okay. Um, that, that means if I take where those two intersect with each other, they won't appear in the resulting moment equation. Right? And so I find that point, and now if I express all of my lengths relative to that point, I'll probably be in a little bit better shape. Okay? Yeah. Okay. He says, is this just the same as making a cut to the left side of E? I don't know. Is that the same? Yeah, it's basically the same thing, okay? What you guys wanted to do to the right, so I'm, I, you know, your wish is my command. At least until it comes time to give you some grades, then I can't quite be so accommodating. All right, so I'm trying to find TIJ. We're looking for point E here and trying to express our lengths of critical pieces relative to location E. So which one do you want to start with? Okay, so H, right, the force at H has both horizontal and vertical components, right? So it would probably be a good idea to think about both horizontal and vertical components of length as well, right? So how far is it horizontally from H to E? Okay. 18 feet plus 9 feet, okay, 27 feet. So let me go ahead and put that in here, 27 feet, okay, and I, t I guess I'll do it down here. Okay, and what else?
How about how far it is vertically from H to E? How do I know that? Okay, we may not be given it directly, but what do we have? Okay. Okay, we have six feet times three is the overall height, right, over here on the left. Then we have three times three is the height up to this lower part of the, of the truss. So 18 feet minus nine feet gives you nine feet. And so that's what this would be. Okay, which is also the height that I would need for TIJ, right? That's also how far it is from the line of action of TIJ uh, to E. Okay, so I think we're good in terms of uh, dimensions. We might want to stick a set of coordinates on here. Maybe I'll call that X. Uh, I'll just put it like this, X and Y, something like this. Just to... Uh, kind of satisfy one of the things we're supposed to do. Well, now that I've got my free body diagram, what's the next step? Okay. Some moments. I'm going to some moments about E. That was my plan all along. Okay. And what components do I have that cause moments around E? Okay, I have the two components that I need to deal with for the force at H, right? So let me put those in first. I'll have uh, a clockwise uh, effect happening due to the horizontal component applied at H, right? That horizontal component is going to be 200 pounds times what for the horizontal? Sine, 40 degrees, okay? multiplied by nine feet, right? Horizontal force component times vertical length component. And it should be negative. Okay, good, good catch on that. And what else? Minus 200 pounds, again, clockwise for the vertical component, right? So negative 200 pounds times the cosine 40 degrees, okay, and that's going to be 27 feet from that line of action to point E. And then lastly, what? Okay, minus TIJ times 9 feet. All this is equal to zero. So Tij is equal to, okay, looks to me like it'll be equal to negative 200 times the sine of 40 degrees times 9 minus 200 times the cosine of 40 degrees times 27 all this over 9, which gives me negative 588.2. And so that we don't miss the forest for the trees, keep in mind, my big point with showing this to you was not only to reinforce the idea of being able to do method of sections, but to show you that occasionally you'll encounter a truss for which you do not need to find the external reactions first. Right? You can sometimes do that. What's the characteristic of this truss that enables us to do it that way? Okay. He says what we need is to the right side of the two supports. So let's generalize that a little bit further and say, if, if what you're trying to find is not between the two supports for your truss, if it's outside of the two supports to one side or the other, um, then 
you can very often not have to find your external reactions first. Okay? So be aware of that, and that way it might save you some effort. Right? Every, every minute saved is a, another minute for a different problem. Okay? Good. So there, you know, good job. You guys, um, I think, picked up on that really quick. Um, and so I'm, I'm proud of you on that. Let me throw a monkey wrench into it. Okay, you ready? Sorry, I messed up. I messed up. I didn't mean to ask you for IJ. I, my bad, my bad. Not IJ, not IJ. No, what I wanted to ask you about was uh, member JK. So sorry. Okay. So now what do we have to do? Okay. So the first thing I hear, I, I hear, I think, out there is an identification that now I'm asking you for a member to find the force in a member that does exist between two supports. So now that I'm asking you for this force in this member that does exist between the two supports, now what do we have to do? Now we do need to find external reactions first. Okay? Shucks. Okay, so if that's what we need to do, what should I do first? Okay? Let's think about this. I probably need to do a free body diagram, someone says. I, uh, I don't disagree with that sentiment. So let me do this. I'm going to take the whole thing. I'm going to copy it. I'm going to put it down here. Okay. And how do I turn it into a free body diagram? Okay. I take these off and I replace them with force vectors that represent what those kinds of supports would do. Right? So since I had a roller right there that rolled on a horizontal surface, it means the force is going to be happening uh, perpendicular to that, which would be vertical. Okay? And I should name that probably, so let me name that uh, RJY. Okay. What do I do at A? A is a pin connection, right? So I need to have two components of reaction there. I'll just show them upward and rightward. Okay, R A Y and R A X. Okay, so that's good. Do you want to do anything different with my forces in my ropes over here? I mean, what if I get rid of all this and uh, instead just show this and just say that's 200 pounds? Okay, does that make everybody happier? All right, so good, good so far. Is there, uh, is there a reaction I can, I can find quickly? for the whole thing. Yeah, I can sum forces in the x direction. Okay, and when I do that, I have RAX. What's my other, any other forces in the x direction? Minus 200 pounds times the sine of 40 degrees. That's it, right? So we set that equal to zero. It tells me that RAX has to be equal to that 200 times the sine of 40 degrees. 200 pounds times the sine of 40 degrees. Oops. Okay, 128.56. Okay. 
pounds. Wonderful. What do you want to do next? Okay, someone says we could sum moments around A. And yes, that is something we could do, but it might not be the easiest thing to do. You could sum moments around J if you wanted, right? What if I sum moments around J? What does that do? Oh. <clears throat> okay. If you notice, if I sum moments around J, it will immediately give me RAY, right? Because I already have RAX, right? So when I sum moments around here, around uh, location J, what we'll find there is I'll have a positive RAX, which is 128.56 pounds, multiplied by its length away from J, which is how far? Okay, so RAX, its line of action goes right here, right? Which means that's my distance right there to, j to J. So we want to use nine feet. Okay, positive because it is a counterclockwise effect that would happen from RAX with the direction I'm showing it there. Okay, then what? Okay. I have RAY that tends to try to rotate it clockwise, right? So let me subtract RAY. And how far is it, its line of action, away from J? 18 feet. Okay, I know that because it's 6 feet plus 6 feet plus 6 feet over there to J. Then what? Okay. The 200 pounds, the vertical component of the 200 pounds creates a rotational effect around J, correct? So I'll take 200 pounds, right, times the cosine of 40 degrees. Okay, that gets me the vertical component, and I need to multiply that by 36 feet. 18 feet plus 18 feet. And that should be all of my effects that create um, rotational effects around J. So then what? Okay, looks like RAY is going to be equal to um, 128.56. That didn't work, did it? 128.56 times 9, right? Minus 200 times cosine of 40 degrees times 36. All of this divided by 18. Negative 242.14. pounds. All right. Now, so far that hasn't been too hard, right? We're finding external reactions. We have one more we could find, right? Jay, question is, do we need to? You got a question? Why would that have been more difficult than getting it around something around A? Okay. I'll show you. His question is, why is this any less difficult than doing a sum around A? Okay, and I'm about to show you exactly why. I had something in mind when I did this. Let's go back and remember that there's a thing called zero force members. Okay, are there any zero force members in this truss? Like where? BL? You can do BL based on joint B, right? You erase it, now you look at joint L. LC. Erase that one. 
Okay, you look at joint K, you can knock out KC. Now you can look at joint C, and you can knock out CJ. All of those were zero force members. Since all of those are zero force members, what it means is that the, the force that we will have in member JK, right? Remember, that's what we're trying to find is the force right here in this member. Well, what that means is that that's really the same force as everywhere along this line. So I had a, a really strong interest in finding the reactions at A first so that I wouldn't have to deal with anything at J. We got a question over here. CJ? Okay. So it's zero because, right, I knocked out all those other members, right? I had all the other members that I knocked out, and you felt good about those, right? So, like, I think I originally had one on CK, right? You felt good about knocking that one out because of the joint at K? Okay. Now we look at CJ and look at the joint at C. Right? You have two collinear members, BC and CD. Right? You have a third one that's not collinear, CJ. You have no external forces acting on C, which we're, we're doing all of this based on looking at that joint at C. Right? No external forces acting on C. That meets all of our criteria, and it tells us that CJ has to be a zero force member, right? One other way of thinking about it, it's really the same thing, is um, look at C and imagine, uh, join at C and imagine setting up a set of coordinates, or like a coordinate system kind of thing, like this, okay? And then think about summing forces along this axis. CJ would have a component along that axis, but nothing else would. Does that make sense? If I, if I set up a coordinate system for the joint at C, such that one of my axes was aligned with the line of BC and CD, right? Um, then CJ would be the only force component I would have perpendicular to that line between B and C. And because that's the case, it would be the only thing that would show up in my equilibrium equation, and therefore it would be zero. Okay, so that's the, you know, a few explanations as to why CJ ends up being zero. So back to our, uh, our idea here before, if I can figure out the force in member AL, then I have found the force in JK, right? So I had a reason why I wanted to find the reactions at A rather than the reactions at J. So let's go ahead and do our next step, and what is that, you think? Yeah, at this point, there's no reason why we can't just do a method of joints, right? Why don't we just look at joint A and say we're going to have some forces acting on joint A, right? RAX was one of our things that we knew, right? 128.56 pounds. RAY, I'll go ahead and leave the arrow the same direction. You guys seem to like it that like to do it that way, so I'll keep it that same direction, but I will apply what? A negative 242.14 pounds. And what else gets applied to joint A? Okay, I'll call it TAB, and another one here of TAL. Okay, let me throw on some uh, coordinate system here. All right, a couple of axes, X and Y. And what else should I put on here? Okay, some slopes would be good. So I'm going to say the rise and run for member AB, how do I figure that out? OK. 
Okay. So, you know, it's actually maybe a little trickier than it looks at first glance to prove it, right? But uh, it looks like it, it, since this is all collinear from A to B to C to D, it rises by 18, and how far does it go left to right? Yeah, all the bottom values, which is really going to be 3 times 18 feet, minus all the top values, which is 2 times 18 feet plus 9 feet. What does that leave me with? 9 feet, right? This, this length right here, if you do all that subtraction, this length right here is going to end up being 9 feet. Okay, so that tells me that I have a rise. I can put 18 and I can put 9 there, or what is that really? A rise of 2 for a run of 1. No difference, right? Now what do I do for my slope of TAL? Okay, there I have a run of 18 feet, right, and a rise of 9 feet. So what do I have here? 2 to 1, right? 2 run and a 1 rise. Okay, and I think I'm basically ready to write my equilibrium equations. Now one of the things we did with a few of the example problems you've seen so far, uh, we have done example problems where a lot of times one equation ends up being easy to solve at a time. Does that always happen? No, it doesn't. Does it happen in this case? All right. In this case, you look at TAB has both X and Y components, and TAL has both X and Y components, right? which means that we need to be prepared on this one to, be, to have to solve a simultaneous system of two by two, which isn't the end of the world, but it pops up now and then. So I wanted to mention that this is a possibility, right? So what do I do? Go ahead and write them, right? Some forces in the X. So for that, I've got 128.56 pounds plus what? TAB times 1 over the square root of 1 squared plus 2 squared plus TAL times 2 over the square root of 1 squared plus 2 squared. And that should take care of my x direction forces. What about the y? Okay. In the y direction, I have <clears throat> a negative 242.14 pounds plus TAB times 2 over the square root 1 squared plus 2 squared plus TAL times 1 over the square root of 1 squared plus 2 squared. So this is my little 2 by 2 system of equations, and solving it is not that big a deal as long as you have a nice little tool like this one. Okay. Um, before I really even get started, I'm going to do something real quick here and take square root of 1 squared plus 2 squared, okay, and I'm going to store that. Okay, and once I've done that, I'm going to go into equation mode. So mode, option 5, here I need a 2 by 2, and a 2 by 2 is implied by option 1, okay. So now I need to put in my coefficients of my variables. Let's start with AB in the first equation. So my coefficient is going to be what? 1 over that square root that I just stored into A. Okay. 
What's my coefficient of TAL? Okay. 2 over what I have stored in A. Okay. And what do I need to put in for this last number? Okay. Keep in mind, if I put these in with their signs that I have currently, I need to think about moving this one to the other side of the expression to match what the Casio is expecting. So I need to put in not a positive, but a negative 128.56. pounds. Okay, the next line I'll put in a 2 over that square root. I'll put in for the next one a 1 over that square root. And then lastly, when I move 240, negative 242.14 that I have on the left over to the right, it becomes positive 242. And when I hit equals, my x value that it gives me there is for the first variable that I put coefficients in for, which would be TAB, and that is 456.78. I feel like I should go play poker right now. just got a five in a row right there. I think that's called a, it's called a straight, right? <laughs> sorry. A little too obscure. I'm sorry. Okay. And what's my other one? Negative 372.13. Okay. So this would be T-A-L. Uh, Negative 372.13. And by our logic we just did by, uh, by thinking about these zero force members, this is also equal to TJK. Okay? Negative means what? Opposite of our assumption, we assume tension got negative, means it must have been compressive. So we have a compressive force of 372.13 pounds in member JK. Yes, sir? Okay, I think he's saying uh, we could have used line segment AC to try to get the slope of AB. And as long as we know all of our uh, lengths, so let's think about that. Is that directly above? Okay. Yeah, that, that looks like that may have worked. Okay. Again, a run of 6 for a rise of 12. That works, yep. So good observation. Didn't see that right at first, but we got there anyway. Look at that. You're going to be way ahead on the test. Any other questions? Yeah. Question is, if you're on an exam and you have one like this where you have to use a previous result in a subsequent calculation. How many um, decimal places should you carry along the way? Okay. The best answer is store your results into variables in your calculator. Okay. Good question. Someone says, how do you do that? If you have this calculator, okay, what you do Let's say I do some sort of a calculation. I say I've got 9 times 6. That's my calculation. I hit equals and I go, ooh, that's going to be useful to me somewhere along the way. I would like to keep that. Right? What you do is for this calculator is you hit shift to grab this little uh, command right here that says STO. Right? Stands for store. Right? Hit that and now it says, hey, I'm ready to store something. 
and you have A, B, C, D, E, F, M, Y, and X that you can store things into. Okay? Um, and so you can pick any of those. Maybe I want to store it into C. So I hit that button. I didn't need to hit anything else. I didn't need to hit like alpha or anything. It was ready to put it into one of those spots based on whichever key I hit, right? So now that result that I got from a you know, prior calculation is ready for me to use in a subsequent calculation, uh, and it will keep a lot of digits, right? And that way you don't have to worry about you know, accumulating error as you go along. That's the best answer, right? Short of that, I know not everyone can see far enough ahead in their problem to where they know which ones to store, right? So what I would recommend is this. Um, you probably are OK once you get out to around six or so sig figs, which is a little bit of overkill, right? Usually, usually that's more than you need, but you're usually going to be pretty safe if you carry about six significant figures through your calculations. Uh, you'll be close enough when you get to the end that there will be very little discrepancy. Um, I will mention that the way that nearly all, if not all, of the problems are computed on the exam, um, they will be correct out to however many decimal places it gives you, right? And a lot of students like the, the sureness or the, you know, being assured by their answer matching for all of the decimal places that are given. And if you want that assurance, then carrying more decimal places is a good idea. Okay, his question is, when you write the problems, how many do you carry out? Do you carry out seven or eight decimal places or whatever? Um, the, uh, the exam is written in MathCAD, right? So the answer to that question is, I don't even know how many decimal places it has behind the scenes but it's a lot. So, yeah, the test is written in MathCAD, and it does all the computations, but, you know, that way. It's good questions. Any other questions? <laughs>